Uh, this is the episode of Data Council Live with Soda and as a co-presenter. I'm very excited to be here and talk about data contracts. We have some renowned experts in the field uh, with us today and very grateful for them to share their knowledge and wisdom um, with the community. So I'm going to kick it off and, and actually have them introduce themselves briefly um, so that we all know who they are and what their involvement in data contracts is. Um, let's kick it off with Andrew. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, I'm Andrew, I'm based in the UK and I'm a principal engineer and I, I guess I kind of created data contracts a few years ago as a way to describe how I wanted to build data platforms and change data culture. So I've been thinking about data contracts quite a long time um, and earlier this year I got the opportunity to write a book about data quality and data contracts, so I'm all for it as well now. And Andrew, where are you currently working? Uh, I work for a company called GoCardless. Uh, fintech based in the UK. Great. JG. Yeah, so I'm JG or Jean Georges, and uh, I'm a lifetime IBM champion. I'm the chair of the Biddle Steering Committee, uh, which Biddle is uh, is hosting the uh, ODCS Open Data Contract Standard, uh, part of the Linux Foundation. I'm also the chief innovation officer at uh, ABA Data. That's my current job, and all offers of multiple books and I promised my wife I'd do less in 2024. I probably won't drop Lego playing. <laughs> Great, Max. Hey folks, uh, I'm Max. I'm uh, currently Associate Director of Engine Data Engineering at HelloFresh, um, where I'm leading the data platform. And uh, I've basically been like working on data platforms both at uh, HelloFresh as well as previously at Zalando, um, and always had a strong focus on like building tools that allow people to work better with data. And that has directly driven me into the hands of data contracts as well. Uh, previously been very, very active about the data mesh topic as well. Um, done a lot of trainings and uh, written on that topic as well. Uh, but yeah, for the past, I would say nine months, I guess, since I joined HelloFresh, uh, I've been very, very actively working on data contracts and practice. So happy to be here today and share some of my experiences. Great, and Tom? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. And uh, I'm a co-founder of and CEO of Soda. And I've been a, a long time software engineer. And so now after uh, being the creator of Soda um, Data Contracts Enforcement Engine, I think uh, it's, it's good inspiration that software engineering background to see what data actually can gain from everything, all the knowledge there that we've built up over the years. And I think in data, um, some of those aspects uh, make sense to translate there. So uh, that's uh, that's basically my mission. Great. Well, thanks again to you all for, for being here. Um, I want to kick things off and get into a definition of data contracts because I noticed that there's no lawyers on the panel. So apparently data contracts are not some weighty tome-like legal agreement that we're all entering into. Um, Rather, what, what are data contracts? Um, obviously, it's a term that's become popular in the last couple of years. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to get the panelists' take on what's in scope and what's out of scope um, for data contracts for this discussion. Yeah, I, I can go with a, a definition. Um, I mean, data contracts, there's a few ways to look at it, but I think one of the things is they are the interface for data. So if every way you make data available to other people in your organization to build upon. Um, if you're familiar with things like data products and using data product technology, then you can say it's the thing that makes your data, data product available to others, so you can link it to data products. Um, but yeah, variety of the interface that allows data to be made available, to be built upon with confidence. Cool. Got it. Data yeah, contracts, so data, sorry, uh, data products becoming available to, to others in the org. Um, sorry, uh, someone else is going to jump in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So API for data, I think that's really, uh, that's really an in interesting take. Uh, and that, that kind of resonates for me as well as uh, being a past, uh, before I went into the data, I was in the software engineer. And there, like APIs, um, and let's say, yeah, APIs as well as on a component level as on microservices, for instance, are all about encapsulation. 
I think mm -hmm. that's exactly uh, what we need in data. And that's why I think uh, contracts is going to be kind of like a revolutionary because like we, we didn't have this in, in data before. And the API, API for data is more like, look, when you make data available to someone, you do it as a data set or a table or uh, something of that nature. And then whatever the implementation was doesn't really matter. And then this is this is your interface. And now you as a client or a consumer, how am I going to consume this data? So that's essentially what a contract is. It's, it describes to any user to uh, be able to get started with consuming data. And, and this is also um, like an interface where the, the software interfaces have, for instance, HTTP as a basis. Well, this, this is quite different in data. And that's why data needs a different kind of interface because you're working with the warehouse or the database driver protocol. Uh, and the way you consume it is not by JSON in, JSON out, but it's more like you, you send a SQL query over that specific protocol and you get a, a bunch of data coming back. And you need to know like the columns and the schema and all that. So in that sense, it's a new way to define an interface on how to consume data. And I think it's going to enable um, encapsulation and therefore yeah, have the same effect as um, object-oriented programming or um, like microservices had on the software engineering space. I think this is the same is going to happen here as well, enabling much much larger um, yeah projects and and scalability of data uh, where now things get clogged down very fast. But probably yeah. talking way too long here, so. Uh... <laughs> Before I, get I, I, ju I just wanted to, to to jump on one point there as well. Like um, an interface also always means that it's a it's a uh, tool for communication and collaboration, mm -hmm. right? Like it's it, it's really about like yeah. where basically you have like a clearly defined language with which people are now speaking to each other, and that language happens to be easily understandable for the people as well as for the machines. Um, because that makes it such that you can actually like add some automation and some enforcement around that instead of just putting a piece on paper um, and signing it off and then throwing it away and not looking at it anymore in two months, right? So like like that, that's like one of the key aspects for me as well that we are structuring the communication around data um, by giving like a very structured way on how people are interacting with each other. <laughs> and and so to that point, I'm wondering, um, is there a minimum size? organization that benefits from data contracts? Is there a minimum size, um, you know, scope or sprawl of sort of the, the data projects a team is working on? Um, I'm just curious in, in sort of the real world um, in the panelists estimation, like when's the right time for a team to start to look at data contracts? What, what's the sign that something is bad enough or um, what, what are the indicators that a team should start to look at um, in investing in, in data contracts in their own org? Do you have a do you have a do you have a pipeline? Do you use a data pipeline? Then if you do if you use a data pipeline, you should be doing data contracts. That's that's as early as it as it starts. Okay. Um I think that the data contract is really the link between the producers uh, the producer of the data and, and the consumer of the data. It, it it's a link also between the physical and the logical world. And it's a definition not only of the metadata. But the meta metadata, and by meta metadata, I I think about the quality, the SLAs, and all this this behavior of the data itself. Okay, so I think it's critical to start as early as possible to be doing data contracts. Uh, it clarifies things, uh, as as Max said, it's it's a wonderful tool for communication, um, but this you know you can have. Communication problem with a team of five. So, yeah, I'd agree. I think if you're going to try and do something with data and you want that to be reliable and you want it to be built for a medium to long term, then you probably want you, you need that contract, Randy. If you're otherwise, it's just not it's just not going to be reliable. Isn't it? You can't build it with confidence. And and that of course also doesn't mean that you start with like a ten page data contract for like the first table that you put in the organization. Right? It's like like you start with like the the minimum that makes sense for you, right? Like and and like to be honest, even just documenting how a certain table is named and where to find it is like 
that that can be the first data contract that you have right as, as long as you like note that down somehow and then you like extend that over time because your team of five might not have a communication problem yet if they do maybe you have other things to tackle um but that team of five will be 15 at some point will be 50 the next day um at some point you will start having like more distribution more friction uh, and you need to you can no longer just rely on verbal communication. Um, and then every single bit that you have put down in your initial very simple version of a data contract originally um, is documentation that will make sure that your organization can still work also once it outgrows this like mini startup phase. It's, it's an iterative process. Okay, as you said, Max, the thing is, you start by basic information, you keep adding, uh, and it becomes richer and richer. And to another thing to, to what Max said regarding the, the organization, it's not only about the team growing, it's also about the team leaving and new people coming in. So it's it's this continuation of, I, I, I'm always wondering if it's a politically correct term these days, but it's a, this tribal knowledge that you've got into the enterprise that you can finally document, okay? And, and this is, oh, I know that Andrew wrote this thing, okay? So I can ask a question, even if Max is a new owner of the, of the contract because Max could be on vacation or at the doctor this afternoon. So, so as we're lingering on um, sort of defining, you know, data contracts and, and, and setting up the, the rest of our conversation, um, I'm excited to get into a bunch of implementation questions um, with you guys, but I wanted to first just mention that, you know, one of the hangups that um, I hear from folks in the community um, especially those of us who've been in data a while, um, you know, uh, interestingly enough, is how is a data contract different than a schema? Because I think we have this sort of um, baseline understanding of, you know, what a proper data schema looks like or what proper normalization looks like. Um, and we're all used to sort of the, the, the relational database um, model in, in most cases. Um, so I, I just wanted to like step off from there and, um, and, and pause, the, pause the question to you all. Um, how do you explain to folks that that data contracts is 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 more really more than just a schema? Yeah, to me, the the contract is the extension of the schema because the schema itself is not enough. It's it's a great basis. If you know that's where the table is and you know like, okay, these are the columns and this is the data types, you already technically can access the data. But then again, like there's a lot of var cars out there. Um, what's in it, what's the format. And for some applications that doesn't make uh, a lot of difference, but for most data applications, it does. And then it's important that you understand that data at a much deeper level. And that's exactly where data contracts go beyond what the, the database schema can give you. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. I think, yes, extension of a schema. It's also, data contract will have things like schema management and you can evolve a date contract without breaking anything downstream. So you have some sort of migration there. Um, if you have a schema that can change anytime, you can change the database, then that's not going to be something you can build on easily, at least not if you want something to be reliable for any period of time. Um, so you have to have some kind of interface that goes beyond just a table and that handles you know, its version. It's got a migration path. You can make non-breaking changes to it, but breaking changes have a sort of migration path to it. All those kind of things you need. Again, the API analogy works really well. Like um, all those kind of things you need if you want to build on something with, with any confidence. I, I want to acknowledge um, something that uh, JG put out um, in the open data contract standard, which I found helpful. Um, perhaps we can paste this, the URL to the project. Um, in the in the show notes, but um, it was helpful to me to understand just sort of looking at the the open data contract standard, the table of content, the table of contents, um, which sort of explain very quickly at a high level the scope of what's what's being discussed. And there are things like data sets and schema, data quality, pricing, stakeholders, roles, SLA, service level agreement, um, etc. So I I I, I appreciated um, understanding. Um, sort of having a, a more um, expanded mental model of everything that can go into data contracts. And um, I know um, this standard o ODCS is something that 
um, we'll be talking about today. So I just wanted to, to tip off the attendees to that and say that there's a good body of work that's been um, popping up under that project. Um, JJ, do you want to quickly introduce the project and, and tell us how it started? Yeah, so 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 Odysseus is now part of a, a project called Beetle, which is hosted by the Linux Foundation. Um, and, and the idea was, I've seen data contracts in many, many forms, okay, from iPhone code to Excel sheets to Word document to paper in pages where people were signing stuff, okay? Uh, and there was really a need for, if we want to create a real value around the data contract is to let's make them standard or as standard as possible. And uh, so first, when I was working with, uh, with a financial institution, uh, we open sourced a data contract template. And uh, from there, basically, the, the nonprofit IDA user group and uh, the Linux Foundation took over to create this, uh, this open data contract standard, ODCS. And uh, we've, we are like 15 members on the steering committee, on the technical steering committee. Uh, Andrew is part of it. Tom is also part of it. Uh, I am. I've got the honor of chairing the committee, and um, we, we're just new. Okay, so the thing is, is, there's more room for more people. Max, please join us. Um, and, uh, and 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 we need also a bit more. Uh, we need more women because it's very male, and uh, so we need we need we need to expand our horizon a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so the thing is, this is the idea of that is to create. Uh, there's kind of three group of of people in the steering committee. You've got users, you've got service companies, and you've got vendors. Okay, so typically Soda is is one vendor that is part of the steering committee and driving kind of the adoption of the the data quality component of those uh of this of this standard okay and as you said uh, pete there's eight there's eight blocks in the data contract that correspond to eight kind of needs around that okay and schema is part of it schema is one okay but there's seven others yeah Great. and then i wanted to uh expand a bit on why this actually is important i think because like the data stack at this moment is super fragmented. There's loads of small tools. There's not like there's big uh, platforms as well, but there's a lot of tools that you as a data practitioner have to cobble together. And the data contract there and the the, the initiative um, with Beetle is all about like if you start from the schema and all of the other factors around it, like there's a million tools that can benefit from the schema and having extra configuration information in the schema or embedded in that schema file. And that that essentially is uh, what this initiative is doing. It's enabling a, a language that you don't have clashes between the tools and that you have like a common language to express all those different, um, those different aspects used by different tools, so that all the different tools can use the same contract file. Um, and I think that's gonna be very valuable going forward. Well, we definitely need more vendor neutral standards organizations um, in the community and at data council we've always supported um, vendor neutrality and um, appreciate seeing the community come together um, to build these standards so um, this is definitely a standard that we want to um, you know promote and 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 represent to our community as well so i'm glad that um, we have the the author here and uh, participating. So thank you, JG, for that. Um, someone asked a question in the chat, which I think is particularly um, pertinent for, for this level of conversation. Um, what's the kind of information that can be stored in the data contract? Can it be business rules for data sets? Um, I think the answer is definitely yes, but I wanted to let the panelists um, take a shot at that. Max, any, any thoughts? Yeah, like, um... As we already touched upon before, like a data contract is like something that um, that that it evolves iteratively, right? Like you start with something very simple, like a schema definition, for instance, um, together with like I don't know some some ownership information, uh, some information about like where to find the data to begin with. Um, you add some things on top of that, like like SLOs, SLAs, um, uh, and then you keep on expanding, keep on adding like more. 
uh, advanced concepts for that. And like for what I've seen so far, um, that's usually where most stop at the moment, but not because we, I think that's where we should stop, but because we are just not there yet in terms of the iteration. Um, so like right now, for instance, the data contracts that I'm working with um, is, is pretty much covering like what I, what I just said. Um, but I very much foresee this advancing further um, to actually have um, no longer just data contracts, but entire data product definitions um, to be following the same format as we currently do with data contracts. Right? That you have something that where you basically just fill out a template um, and that includes your business rules, your business logic, um, so that you can um, produce a new data product based on the, the specifications that you've actually given in. And um, we're by far not there yet. Um, for instance, at the moment at HelloFresh, we have like a separate project that is doing exactly that second part to do like template-driven data development, I guess. Um, and then we attach data contracts to that as a second component. Um, but I very much foresee that those two things will merge in the future. Hmm. I find it interesting that we're that we're talking about data products. Um, like it's come up several times already in the conversation. Um, are we all in agreement that um, data contracts in an ideal world would drive data products, or is there any any disagreement on that point? Is there's no disagreement? Just to reinforce that, I think you will need if you want to think about data products you will need data contracts uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a requirements this way around you can have as as you asked earlier okay the basic thing is you've got a data pipeline a data contract will already, already bring a lot of value to you but if you want to go towards a data product you will require data contracts on probably more than one and then if you want to go to the next step which is data mesh for me, then you will definitely require even more data contracts. So. <laughs> um, well, let's let's switch gears and start to talk about um, data contracts more in practice in the org. Um, who owns the data contract? And who wants to own the data contract? And who should own the data contract? I'm I'm sure anyone, the, <laughs> just that, I'm, I'm not sure there's anyone that wants to own it. That's that's. I've, but that is our honor you get it. <laughs> well, you can, it's all about incentives as always, but um, I think the owner has to be the people who produce data. Um, only they can really like influence the quality of the data. Only they know, have a full context of the data. Um, yeah, only they can really own data contracts. No one else can. You can't have someone else own a data contract or someone else's data because what incentive have they got to meet your contract? Um, where, where's the collaboration there? So I think it has to be the data producer. If the same way, API is owned by the producing team, exactly the same. Um, and in terms of whether they want to, I think that just comes down to incentives and priorities. It's the same problem you have in organizations all the time, right? Like you have multiple teams trying to work together to produce something that's creative and some parts to give value to organization. Some of the teams might have produced data for another team. Um, if that's important to the organization, then you get that prioritized, you get that incentivized, get the incentives lined up, make them all feel part of the value they're generating, um, have KPIs, or whatever you want to do, whatever your organization does to incentivize teams working together. One of those happens to be producing a data product with a data contract around it and committing to, produce, committing to maintaining that for the long term so a business can, a part of the business can build on that and provide value. Whether that's like an ML model, reporting, or other engineering teams, other product engineering teams building data-driven applications, doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, it's just a problem of incentives and prioritization, like same as any, same as any other. Yeah, yeah to, oh, go okay, for it, guys. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, I I think that that also really depends, like specifically when you connect it to the to the data product part, right? Because when when you actually own the data product that has a data contract on top of that. And I fully agree, like data contract is fundamentally about like giving promises, giving guarantees to others about something that you are offering. Um, so it definitely has to be the, 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 the data owner for that matter. When you do that properly with product thinking, that means you offer something of value to the organization. 
And that is also where the incentive itself comes from um, to give guarantees, to give promises, to engage with your stakeholders, to figure out what they actually need and want. And that is where like this, this incentivization that, that Andrew just said um, is often coming from the team itself that owns mm. it. And I've seen this a couple of times now that we we started like a data contracts initiative in, uh, internally and a bunch of teams came to us and said like, hey, like we want to properly own our data. We want to offer this as a product and we want to even understand who are actually our stakeholders, right? And if you then have a data contract in place and you have something where people can, let's say, subscribe to and sign up on um, to like register themselves as stakeholders, all of a sudden you have like a much better dependency mapping across the organization as well and that again then benefits also the owner because finally for instance if they need to do a change they don't just like turn a knob and break all of production but they actually know whom to talk to first because they have like a proper registered list of stakeholders yeah one thing is we need to convince the, the data owners sorry tom but the, we need to convince the data owners that the benefits of owning it is actually superior to the burden of maintaining it. And I think it's not that easy to, to, to do actually. No, and this it's is not, exactly- it's not, it's not that easy, sorry. Yeah, it's not that Go easy. And it's, uh, um, it's the same. The interesting part here is when you compare this to software engineering, no one is actually asking the question. If you say like you produce a microservice, who's gonna own the API? Yeah, right. It's the team that produces, that manages and operates the service, right? And and for some reason here, the analogy totally makes sense. And in data, this is this is like, oh, who owns the data? And as you mentioned initially, it's the hot potato. You like, and the reason I think uh, why this comes from is because the whole analytical data pipelines are coupled together uh, like spaghetti code. So the one at the end doesn't know what they're getting, so they cannot mm -hmm. take ownership of what they're producing on top of that. So if you start at the source or at the natural tendency is if you when you start with data contracts that you tend to go earlier and earlier to push this forward because if you want to take ownership of everything that you produce then you need to know what you're getting in and if that has a contract then you can be sure you understand that and so that's how everyone can start taking ownership and when the hot potato thing uh, becomes a lot easier uh, if uh, if your source also has a contract so i think that's uh, that's where it starts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i think that's a great analogy um and i and i, I do want to um you know go a little bit deeper there because um you know my concern would be that the the business side of the house the folks that believe that they're um you know um, initiating the the creation of the data product or they need to share the data product with customers or partners or clients um like if these people feel like there's roadblocks being put up in the way of them just quickly getting access to the data because, well, they know SQL and they can talk to the database directly. Um, I'm curious, like in the real world, um, how you sort of mediate these concerns because, um, I mean, I think we all as, as engineers understand the, the power and the potential and the necessity of establishing these contracts at the origin of the water supply, as Tom said. Uh, but how do we get the rest of the organization on board when they just feel like potentially we're throwing more roadblocks and more rules um, in place that that um, you know reduce time to market on their side? Um, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that and, and how you handle this in your own orgs. Uh, it it really depends what role you're, you're you're thinking. Okay, for example, a lot of my consumers are data scientists, um, and they don't see the data contract because they they just don't care. But what they're really interested in, it's the and and discoverability that it's actually bringing, because you're bringing trust, uh, you're bringing uh, detailed information about the data itself, and then they can say, okay, well, this is actually the data set I was looking for. Uh, without having to go through thousands of pages in Confluence, which are probably not even up to date, right? So, so that's for them. It's kind of a, it's kind of an easy win. Um, and my hope also is that as it becomes part of the normal work, to expect a data contract when they're looking for something. Well, so this is to say that data contracts can promote discoverability. Yes. Other other examples of that, or or other aspects of how you win win over your business facing teams. I I had a very interesting conversation as at a, at the data masterclass recently, where 
somebody said before, like everybody's always talking about shift left, right? Like you, you want to bring responsibility closer to, for instance, where the data is originally coming from. And somebody said an interesting phrase, before you shift left, you need to first shift right. Because first you need to actually engage with those business people who have the actual data need. And you need to first figure out what is it, what, what is that particular need? Right, like what? What is the business use case that's sent behind of that? Like, what's the actual value that you're generating with that? And once you are actually capable of quantifying that, then all of a sudden the the incentivization to push people to actually do something about it becomes much much easier. Like if if you're actually coming and saying, yeah, like we have this, I don't know, like four million dollar use case, um, but we can only do it if we have this and this data with like proper quality. Um, then you can go to the to the team uh, that's supposed to own that, and like all of a sudden the conversation becomes comes to a totally different level than just randomly picking something that already exists, realizing it breaks at the other day, and then starting to shout at people, right? So like like the whole process of like how also new data is created and how it is then properly uh, covered with 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 contracts for that matter. Um, uh, comes in from a totally different angle all of a sudden because the the business use case itself stands at the core of everything that you're actually doing for the organization. Well, I love that shift right to shift left. Um, I think that's uh, it's definitely very quotable and very interesting because we have to remember that um, the systems that we're building are in service of um, of of the end users at the end of the day anyway. So that's uh, that's well said. Well, let's talk about um, how 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 the contracts are actually enforced because we we touched on who owned them, and I think the the panel is in agreement that it's definitely the the producer side of the house. Um, what are your experiences in actually enforcing the contracts? Um, are these um, are there systemic ways? Are there um, sort of policy and review ways? Um, like let, let, let's talk a little bit more um, in in the real world. I mean, examples of like what goes what goes wrong when a data contract isn't fulfilled. Well, the first thing is you've got to ensure that the owner has kids, so you can kidnap them, and then you threaten <laughs> to give them back if it doesn't maintain correctly. Uh, that's 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 a helpful. First thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <Right>. that's Mumbai. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you uh, looking for your kids? <laughs> <laughs> I might hear somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there, there might be other ways that might be uh, uh, more suitable for the workplace. <laughs> um, I think, like, you can try. I, I don't really like having reviews. My people saying you've got a review from a person and they're on bottleneck. I think bottlenecks are slow going down. Um, you just have a gatekeeper and yeah, slow something down. I think you can automate a lot better way. I think you can. Um, allow the data producers to define their own data contracts. You have a certain amount of, sort of CI checks on that. At say, you know, whether they're making a breaking change or not, that might that might create an issue. Um, get as far as you like, really, and then you can merge it to a platform, and it can be deployed, and the interface can keep up date day contract, and then you've got your interface that's in sync with the contract at all times, and that's what you need for the start, I think. I mean, you keep going further, really, like. Like I think we've always saying, you can iterate on this. So you could have when the producer tries to write data to that interface, they can run some checks on that and they can get alerts. And if the alerts fail, they can they can deal with that like any other incident they deal with. Um, you can have checks later in the data platform side, in the data warehouse side. Um, as early as possible, really, you want the checks to be so that all issues are localized and the alerts go to the data owner and they can then deal with it before the data goes throughout your data warehouse and in front of your customers, your own customers. Um, so yeah, I think, don't make it sound too complicated really. It can be quite simple to start off data contracts. Um, and then you just evolve from there and keep adding more checks, more automation, but doing so in a way where you've promoted the autonomy of data producers to talk to their data consumers and find the data products that they need without central check, without asking, a date governance person or someone like that to, to review every data set because for those people who don't have the context on the data, they don't understand the use case, they're not quite able to do that. But maybe I'm optimistic, but I think if you get the right people talking together and give them the right tooling and the automation, 
fell to the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I, I think I, I think one, one one important thing is that it's it's not only about enforcing the data contract. Of course, you want to enforce it, but it's also to use it as a detection tool. Okay, so for example, you've got a data contract on a, on a on a pipeline, and that that is actually this this one configuration file soda is using it to detect the quality issues on your pipeline detect something and then notify you the 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 time to detection of an issue is reduced drastically okay so it's not about oh make sure that it's enforced but it's about the time you use to detect the error because this is in data, this is where I've seen the, the worst scenario. When a software microservice is not working, for example, you've got you've got some you've got your phone that is ringing quite quickly. In data, it can be subtle, okay. And I've got our stories about like you know two months later. Oh, there's this report that is a, this monthly report that has not been uh, delivered on time. But if we add the right pipeline and the right data contract, not even the right pipeline, but just even the right data contract monitoring this the, the, the pipeline the faulty pipeline then we would have won like two months okay so and not be and that that kind of consequences in a regulatory environment um can be drastic yeah that, i think that that's totally valid and also i see that the constructs are going to shift that even one step further as you mentioned like not only notice faster but ensure that that data just doesn't get in uh, the circuit breaker pattern is going to be the norm after the data contracts uh, are adopted and i think like if if you do the comparison there like in a, a database like what's the function of a database it's like preventing bad data that doesn't comply with the schema to get into it because we've learned that if we don't understand properly what's in the database then afterwards it's a big mess and you don't yeah, can't do a lot with it and here's the same thing like Today in data, it's still the norm that you have like incre incremental data tables where each batch is just appended or just added. And then you're even like those that do data quality on the spot, they will just do it on the incremental data with a filter. But I think data contracts actually are the driver to say, no, let's let's make sure that we run the data quality checks and all the, the data contract enforcement on that new data before we actually append it. And then uh, there's much more guarantees that you will only find good data and still get uh, notified early. And um, typically, uh, Tom, do you see the data quality checks um, being written by the same team that's um, producing the data contracts? Or what kind of cross-team collaboration is required um, in the definition of a data quality standard since we're on the data quality topic for a moment? Yeah, so we see data quality checks coming from all over the place. So the whole business is involved in, in data. They all have um, their requirements or their domain knowledge of the data, but then getting it into the contract. And I think also contracts and ownership, the discussion that we have earlier um, is really helpful because the business, those are the people that drive the requirements. And so what uh, what we've invested in is a, is a discussion platform, a collaboration space where the, um, the anyone in the business can start a discussion with the team managing the contract. And so it's the, the owners, the data producers that are responsible for the data that can then decide on how this uh, data quality check should be implemented. Because there's a lot of data quality checks that someone, anyone could just activate or do. But then if you do that at scale, Sometimes a uniqueness uh, check on like a very large table is something that the, the engineering team wants to review whether that's actually appropriate or not. Um, so those kind of uh, things make a lot of sense or like anyone can contribute to the domain knowledge, uh, but it's I think the engineers that uh, have to take the ownership of making sure that this all runs uh, properly. And, and I think that's that's exactly one of the things that data contracts is also making like massively simpler, right? Like like so far again, like we're actually using soda and like we, we can uh, 
building data quality checks for quite a while. And like we really saw, um, like John just said, like it was all over the place, right? Like sometimes even the, the consumers build their own checks on the input data before they start their processing so that they can for themselves know that everything is actually according to quality because the producers themselves were not giving them any guarantees whatsoever. Um, and they didn't even like know how to set up such kind of things. Um, so it was like a lot of effort of like self-control. And then when you find something, then push back and tell them to fix it. Um, and like absolute hassle, like a massive loop of, of improvement. Um, and this is like really the one thing where I think like data contracts are also massively simplifying that because we also simplifying the interfaces to, to set up something like this, right? Like you're almost going to an extent of having like, uh, like easily language understandable ways of defining your checks, right? Like, like you, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like we are going full circle here because it's something that we've been doing in databases already like 30, 40 years ago, when you actually define that something cannot be null or something can only have like certain values or something like this, right? Like we didn't have that for like 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 data lakes and such kind of setups for way too long. Uh, but now we are like going back there of actually saying, okay, in my contract definition, I tell you like, what are the criteria? What are the constraints, constraints that I have? And it's like very easy, understandable for a human. And and then all the, the platform tooling comes in that, that, that Andrew was, was, was speaking about earlier to then automate the whole setup and execution on the back so that you as the data owner don't even need to worry anymore about like, how does the infrastructure look like? How do I run it? How do I monitor it? Um, you just like define the contract, platform takes care for you. Um, and then all you have to do is, well, wake up when you get called because your data is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I like Max when you're saying about about the data lake. I, I like to think that the data lake is a, a bit like the dark ages of oh. of data. Uh, you know, you, we were we were super structured when we did relational databases with foreign keys and things like that. As and then we had the star schema we were in warehouse, which was probably and all these things which are maybe a little slightly too complex. And then let's open bar with the with the data lakes and and just put everything there. No governance. Just throw your things around. And I think that's now in the twenty twenties we are in a phase where we're taking this thing a little bit more seriously, okay? It's okay, baby data is a new oil, but the thing is nobody does anything with oil besides ref refine it, okay? And data contracts, data products are actually here to, to help that, that process. Great comments. Um, and I want to remind the listeners to drop their questions in the chat. Um, we'll save a few minutes at the end. Um, time's going by so fast. so. Um, we'll keep the conversation moving, but i um, excited to get to a couple of audience questions um, at the end of the program. So I wanted to talk about um, like a real world implementation scenario. Um, Max, I think it was you that talked about starting small. Um, so I was wondering, could you share with us, like how did you actually implement your earliest data contracts at HelloFresh? Like give us a real world case study um, for, for a minute or two, if you don't mind. So the earliest data contract was literally written on paper and signed off. And that was about five years ago. <laughs> so of course that didn't work at all <laughs> um, because you are completely lacking the enforcement, right? And, and th this is like the tough part. Like if you cannot control um, anybody who's actually working with the content, we'll have forgotten about it later after two months. Right. And and this is like something that, that has been going on for a while where, yeah, I think it was like around nine months ago. So like we, we started like diving super deep into it of like on the one hand side, defining the standardized format um, to to basically make sure we have something that that can that is very easily understandable, but and, and can be followed in a very easy way. Um, but at the same time is machine readable. Right. And then we I, I never spoke about data contracts in that context. I almost always immediately spoke about automatable data contracts right? because it, it was it was so important to say right from the start, we are giving the tooling to uh, not only have the standardized interface, but to take that interface and automate literally everything for you. Right, and that comes with um, the setup of the checks uh, again, like like Soda checks, for instance, that we are using there. Um, setup of like uh, schema validation that you do upfront. 
including all the things for like monitoring and alerting, right? Um, even depending on criticality of the data set. Um, if it's low criticality, you get like a ping on Slack. Um, if it's high criticality, you actually get like woken up in the night um, whenever that is necessary. And this is like really where, where we started with the core building blocks, right? We, we, we took the open source contract. Um, we took that as the as the standard at the beginning, way too complex for us, right? Like like these these eight points. Like if you take all of them in and ask your first data producer to do that, um, they they will like run away screaming. Uh, but like we've broken it down to like what were the first and smallest things that actually mattered for us, and that was like SLOs, schema, ownership, list of stakeholders, um, and some some uh, basic level description of the of the data product itself. Right, and that's really like how we are, how 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 we have started, um, and now we are onboarding like more and more use cases to that very simplified template for which we already have the tooling that automates everything behind the scenes, um, and now we are slowly starting to think about extending it further, adding new features here and there, uh, cherry picking more of the things from 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 the open source standard, um, and this is like like how we are now slowly incrementally adding new stuff. Great. Yeah, great example. Um, I appreciate that very incremental approach. And it seems like one of the pitfalls that you discovered was um, sort of an over expansive, like over an initial overreach of um, essentially trying to bite off, you know, more more than you or your your, your team, your org might be able to chew um, in terms of the detailed specification of the standard and, and simpler is probably um, better with the contract, at least initially. Um, what other yeah, pitfalls? So, sorry, Gigi, the... for that, but like at the beginning, I don't care about pricing of my data. No, yeah, no, just, no, it's just fine. one of the aspects, right? It, and it, but that's yeah, exactly yeah. like what it's designed to be. I think to 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 cherry pick the parts that are relevant for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think that it's it's obvious that every piece of the 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 proposed um you know standard probably doesn't apply to everyone. Um, JG, jump in. No, no, the, the, I agree. With, I'm, I'm not taking any offense with the pricing part. And at first, it's it's still very basic, but but some companies need it because they have this inter in, intro de department billing and things like that. And and you know, and some people, we all put, we are putting some burden on the producer of the data. Okay, we're hey, just build this data contract now or this data product, and then the, and then the guy the, the producer is coming back saying, and you want me to host that part too and pay for it or for so that that's that's where the pricing is coming from okay whether you actually bill or just just show that it costs some money but I, no offense taken. Well, and, and some people and some people sell data externally i mean that that, that could be the, the core part of their business correct it, it it could be but it was when we put it in the standard it was not designed at this point okay it was more mm. a very naive uh, show kind of show and tell of the pricing it costs because then you can think about companies like you know Dun and Bradstreet comes to mind or Compass or, or this kind of companies where we are selling data but it's it's I think the pricing strategy is more complex than what we planned originally so mm -hmm. but they yeah makes sense um, what other pitfalls have folks seen in in practice um, with you know your teams or teams that you've worked with. Um, when it comes to implementing data contracts initially? It's more coming from the users as a, always a human part of it. And I don't want to blame anyone there, but it's the immediate benefit to a data owner or to a data engineer is not is not super obvious. And we need to take care of those people. They're doing a great work uh, and they're often pinpointed when things are falling apart but then the benefits of doing the contract is going to come but the thing is in the meanwhile in the beginning at least you're asking them to do a lot more so so there's always this you know adoption and support of those data engineers and data architects yeah yeah i'd agree i think you can do the tooling quite easily but if you don't bring them on with you on that journey of people so that's where you kind of start having problems um yeah, I'd agree 100%. Yeah, the, the biggest uh, pitfall that I've seen is not start at the beginning. It's like there's a big back door in every production application that's its database. And so a lot of analytical data starts by just being harvested from a production systems database. We make a copy and we work from that. Mm -hmm. But then the team actually responsible for that delivery, they don't take ownership because it was just taken from the back door um and 
and they're not aware. And so I think that is a major pitfall where companies can focus on is like making sure that the team is aware that look, we are, we, we did connect to your data. We harvested it uh, even in ways that they didn't uh, agree with or whatever, but if it's used, then it needs to be supported. And it should be in theory, a conversation originally, like, do you want to expose your API interface uh, over your database? And if they say no, or at least then you have the conversation, but because that's where ownership uh, uh, starts. And I see that as one of the, the main pitfalls that, that this triggers the cascade of no one can being able to take ownership. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. My, my initial thing with data contracts really start moving away from things like change data capture or sort of ELT processes, dragging data out of the database and using that interface because, yeah, the people that people's data you're taking, they don't know what you're doing. They've got no incentive to make sure it's stable. In fact, they want to be able to change the database quickly and autonomy to take into the features. Um, so that's kind of like odds of what you want when you're building on that data to make something more stable. So there's a conflict there. Um, and data contracts, one of the things I wanted to do that was really move away from that kind of world of just sucking data out of the database and hope for the best. Because um, ultimately that was okay if it was just analytics. I don't, I don't think it was because we spent a lot of money on building analytics and dashboards. But ultimately it was okay. But these days that data is now being used to drive product features, to drive either directly or via like ML, that drive revenue. And it's not okay for it to just be built on yeah, on my back door. Great. Well, um, so, such great thoughts. And um, I want to make sure we have some time for some audience questions. So um, l let me dive into a few of those and um, see, see what the panel's thoughts are. Um, Barrett is asking, following up on Andrew's statement that contracts really must deliver version data, does that inherently imply that the data product is behind an API interface which returns JSON, Panda, CSV? Um, if so, does that not mean that there's additional processing overhead, especially if the data set is large? So sort of a performance-oriented question here from Barrett. Yeah, that's a good question. Particularly when we keep talking about the idea of APIs, it might sound a bit like that. But that's why I think date contracts are different than APIs, where the interface can be a database table in your data warehouse, in BigQuery or Snowflake or whatever you're using. And that table can be versioned. So um, in the example I did in my book where we kind of build a a simple data contract implementation. It's really simple, it's literally just one chapter. So it's not overly complicated to build a simple data contract implementation. We spin up tables in BigQuery, they have a version, which you underscore V1, underscore V2, um, and you version like that. I mean, you create a new version, you just basically create a whole new table, we can manage a migration to that new version. If it's a break and change, if it's non-break and change, obviously we can do as a lot of description. Um, so yeah, it does not imply that it has to be over a sort of JSON or CSV or some else over HTTP interface or anything like that. It could be a, a table in your data warehouse, could be a Kafka stream, a topic, um, could be anything you like really. What matters is that the interface is defined and well managed through a data contract. Right. Um, Alexi is asking, how can I use data contracts? Because I don't have any data pipelines. Um, they're, they're basically, my data pipelines are just for procedures in my database. So I can't catch stuff before data ingestion. Um, so what would your advice be to Alexi as to where to start his journey with data contracts? The, the first thing I would start with is like um, on, on the data that you are offering in the, uh, in the data, database itself, um, you can already have a contract on that as well, right? Like, because um, I always think of data contracts as like two different angles. There's like preventive measures that let you apply before uh, something actually like changes or breaks. Um, like for instance, uh, breaking schema changes, uh, something like this can can be prevented um, because um, that goes again through like uh, certain procedures um, that, that you can apply there. But then there are also... Um, yeah, post-publishing measures, I'm, I'm still lacking for a better word there, um, that basically check like how the data looks like once it has been published, right? And like we, we, we talked about it earlier, um, at the beginning, it might not necessarily be that you want to prevent every single breaking change uh, across the whole organization right from the start, because it can also be very intrusive into the day-to-day um, the -day life of the developer itself. Um, and you need to provide a lot of tooling to make that 
case easier, but you just want to start with, let's say, detecting breaking things earlier. Right, like the the classic example that I, I believe uh, JGP mentioned earlier, we had something exactly like this, like a machine learning model that starts drifting, um, and then like after two months, you realize that one of the input data sets was missing a column um, that was required for that model. Uh, but by that time, you already had like millions of marketing spend going somewhere, right? And like like detecting Oops. these things not after two months, but after like two hours is already making a massive difference to the business, right? So like, like even that can already add a lot of value and then you can still think about in, uh, improving incremental. Yeah, and the, the way that data contract enforcement tools are made actually um, enable two kind of usages, right? And I think that's, that's applicable here because if they're stored procedures and you cannot really like first um, isolate your new data before you actually append it because it's in the stored procedure, then contracts and enforcement allow you to do it on the end result. Then you don't have your circuit breaker yet, but you can start with a contract on the final data set if you want. And then you run it after the fact. But then as you have um, an opportunity to reorganize your, your pipeline and your sort procedure so that you can interject um, the, the check and the verification and the enforcement on the new data, then that's a refactoring and internal refactoring, which... Um, gives you the extra benefit of catching it even sooner. So I think that that enables uh, contracts definitely have that capability of just layering it on top of the existing infrastructure and then gradually moving it to to more circuit breaking uh, over time. Great. Um, well, let's take one more question uh, before we wrap, since it's almost the top of the hour. Um, Erica is asking, how are data rights and usage documented in the standard? Um, example is given a usage restriction that the consumer of the data may not publish data externally within 48 hours after the data lands, as, as an example. I've seen other data rights standards and curious how this compares. Um, so I think this could be a um, ODCS question, um, but it also could be a, a more generic question, right? With, if one wanted to implement um, sort of a usage restriction in their own data contracts, um, so maybe, maybe JG, you want to start, and if anyone has anything else to add, we'll we'll, sure. we'll take take comments yeah, as well. Sure. So 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 Erica, one one thing you can do is it for for that part, it touches service levels. Okay. Uh, so in, in in the service level of section of the of the of the contract, you're saying things like, okay, this data cannot be touched, or this data is not available, or what whatever. Then. The, the rules here are pretty flexible. You can you can define whatever you want. Then you've got to have the right tool that can enforce it if enforcement is needed, okay? But it could be something like a buffer. It could be whatever the technology part you want to do it. But really, there's already this kind of su support for service levels. Uh, we've listed like 12 standard service levels so far, but there's room for... Uh, for improvement, the thing is the, the way we put it. We put the thing in the in the data contract is that when we're thinking about data quality, we're thinking about the seven kind of standard data quality attributes that you can find. But service level salespeople are very creative at thinking at, at delivering plenty of things. And Pete, as you were saying about companies that are selling data, they're even more creative. So that's why the service level can be really what you want. And uh, I'm pretty sure there is a, there's an easy way to do it. Makes sense. Well, everyone, um, that's that's all the time we have. Um, really appreciate you spending the last hour with us and sharing your wisdom and experience with the community. Um, I'm sure folks can find you on LinkedIn or Twitter um, or X as the case may be these days. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you around the data community soon. So thanks, thanks again for joining us.